If you're going to shoot at something, it's generally useful to know how far away it is. I know, I know, but don't worry, the whole video won't be this controversial. People are not usually good at estimating distances with the stock human eyeball, and if Deus Ex and a career in IT taught me anything, cybernetic eyeballs are a bad idea because you're one botched firmware update away from an inconvenient and probably permanent case of blindness. Taking long range shots is really only possible if you have a pretty close estimate of the range to your target. If you're within the mean point blank range of your target, you can put the crosshair or dot on the target, pull the trigger, and you'll be close enough. How far your mean point blank range is depends on the cartridge you're using, the barrel length of your rifle, and the battle zero you've chosen for your optic. If your rifle has a red dot or basic crosshair reticle optic, then range estimation is probably not so important. Your battle zero will get you out to 300 yards or possibly a bit further, otherwise you're holding high and probably missing. If your optic has a more complex reticle that gives you some holds for distance, or it can be readily dialed for known distances, then a rangefinder is extremely useful. In this video, we're going to go over several methods for estimating range, both electronic and analog, mostly for the purposes of extended range shooting. But if you're trying to do like an area study or a range card and you don't have a GPS or you know a map, they can also come in handy for basic surveying, provided you have the needed references. All right, let's get into it. The first and probably most expedient method of range finding is reticle range finding, such as with a BDC reticle in an ACOG or a similar LPVO or other type of optic. These reticles have the advantage of being very intuitive. On most of them, you use a horizontal line for ranging the shoulder width of the target at a distance, and then you use that same hash mark for the holdover at that same range. One advantage this type of ranging has is that shoulder width works regardless of the target's stance, so whether they're standing, kneeling, or prone, you'll still be able to range the target. You should almost always be able to narrow it down to two options, and if it's really close to, for example, the 300 and the 400 meter hash, you go in the middle. There's another type of reticle range finding using an auxiliary portion of the reticle, so range finding bars somewhere in the scope image, but not part of the reticle that you use for shooting. A lot of the time these are based on the height of the target, so you place the base of this reticle range finding element at the feet of the target and then you see how tall they are. Sometimes instead of being the entire height of the target, this is just the torso height of the target, but either way it accomplishes the same thing. Also, as I mentioned, measuring the height of a target is never quite as easy as doing shoulder width. If you don't have a more complicated etched reticle or BDC, you can still do a little bit of math to find out the size of your target using mils or MOA. You plug the estimated target size in inches or centimeters and the target size as measured against your reticle in mils or MOA into a simple equation, do a little bit of long division, and you get a number, which in theory is pretty close to the range of the target. This method tends to be very slow because math is hard. There are also a lot of rounding errors introduced. You have to hold the scope steady enough to be able to count the lines that your target fills and hope the target doesn't move or change stances if you're measuring height, for example. Also, everything about this method is approximate. You're using an approximate measurement of a target based on an approximate size estimate of that target, and then you're using an approximate formula. For MOA, for example, you have to round because it's very difficult to multiply things by 95.5. You also have to remember the formula and how to do long division in your head. Not everybody's very good at that. I'm a liberal arts major, so that kind of math is beyond my capability. How many times does 15 go into 70, Brock? It's been a long time since I did this. I'm going to say it's four. Six, uh, slightly less than six. It's slightly less than five. Is it? Yeah. You're so bad at being Asian. It's like weird. Four. I mean, granted, I was in, I was in fifth grade, uh, I think 40 years ago at this point. So he is 460 yards away. If you have all the time in the world, you can probably do a pretty good job of estimating the range to target using mil or MOA math, but if you're trying to do it in a hurry, it's going to be very approximate. So that's what you can do with just the reticle of your primary optic, but what if you commit to a secondary range finding system? Obviously the fastest, most accurate, and easiest to use option is going to be a laser range finder. Even the cheapest laser rangefinders these days are way more accurate than any of the analog ranging methods. They're also very fast to use. You point at the target, press a button, and you get a number much faster than you can count the hashes on a reticle, try to line up the shoulder width of the guy, or do any math in your head. 
There are some downsides, of course. One is that laser rangefinders require batteries, often very weird ones. I think every rangefinder I've ever owned requires a CR2 battery, which is not shared with any other device that you own, and they last so long that you're probably going to get complacent with replacement schedules. Another potential problem is that a laser rangefinder produces a downrange signature that's visible with night vision, as well as some advanced detection systems like those Russian helmets or a lot of military vehicles, which have systems on board to detect infrared lasers and alert the occupant that they are being targeted. That's a pretty extreme scenario, but it's worth keeping in mind. Laser rangefinders also don't like to work in varied atmospheric conditions, so if there's fog, rain, or dust, a laser rangefinder will often return a completely unusably inaccurate number or just not give you a number at all. Even so, a laser rangefinder is absolutely your best bet for trying to make precise first round hits because they also have angle compensation, which is very important for shooting because it gives you a number you can really use. If you're taking a shot at a pretty extreme angle, then the linear distance to target is not the same as the ballistic distance to target. Angle compensation goes by a variety of names depending on the brand of the rangefinder, but even the cheap ones integrate it to some extent. Sometimes it's called HCD or TBR, etc. There are also standalone monoculars or binoculars that have a ranging reticle involved. One that comes to mind is the Vortex Solo. I have a regular Vortex Solo with no ranging reticle and I really like it for hiking. I really wanted to get the Vortex Solo RT, which has a reticle for ranging both with torsos as well as a mill grid system, but you know what, I'm an MOA kind of guy, so instead I showed it to Brassfax because he's from Europe and he likes the metric system. So he got one and he gives it the Brassfax seal of approval and that's good enough for me. The Vortex Solo RT has a grid reticle which you can use for the manual ranging using MAF, but it's also useful for spotting because you can call misses and give corrections to somebody using a rifle scope that also has a mill grid reticle. The actual range finding component of the Vortex Solo is the torso size range finding element that's integrated into the reticle. That's a lot faster to use and a lot more useful most of the time. This is a pretty handy device because it's multi-purpose. Not only can you use it just as a monocular for spotting targets or looking around, but you can also use it as a range finder. The Vortex Solo monoculars have good field of view, so they're very easy to find the target, especially compared to a lot of laser range finders which don't have the best optical properties, so just looking through those to find targets is not the best. The last thing to bring up is pretty cool. It is the Range R card from Black Hills Designs. This is a laser cut piece of Lexan plastic that has a bunch of different range finding references cut into it. You tie an 18 inch long piece of paracord to the Ranger card, bite the knot on one end, then hold it at arm's length and line up your target with the various range finding lines to measure the distance. The Ranger card is very fast and easy to use and it also has multiple types of targets with sizes already calculated and their individual ranging wedge. So you could range the height of a person, or the height of a car, or the size of a Connex box, or the size of a door, etc, etc. The precision of the Ranger card is on the coarse side of the spectrum, but they have the advantage of being extremely small and lightweight, and the newer versions are made of even thinner plastic, so they're smaller, lighter, and also flexible. These things are also very cheap, so you can buy a whole bunch of them to add some basic range estimation capability to an entire group of guys for substantially less than the cost of one laser rangefinder. Probably the most important thing to keep in mind with rangefinders is that anything other than a laser rangefinder is going to require some kind of reference to make measurement against. Your ideal reference might be a person, depending on what kind of reticle or system you're using, but you could also settle for an object of known size if you're using, for example, a mill or MOA grid reticle. If the only thing you can range with is the shoulder width of a target, then you're going to need somebody who's actually presenting their entire front torso to you. If you're able to range off of any object of known size, then you could theoretically use the width or height of a door frame, or the height of a truck, or the height of an average truck tire. But if you're just looking at a nice nature scene, what are you going to range against? How tall is the average tree? That's right, the answer is unknowable. You may have to get a buddy to run all the way out into no man's land so you have something to measure in the first place. We did a comparison of different range finding methods on a recent expedition using Luke as a subject, and we noticed a couple of things. One, Luke is shorter than some of the other people in the world, so our measurements were assuming the average height of a man, and Luke's a little bit less than that. So the gimmick, of course, is that we're trying to range a man-sized target, but unfortunately, all we have is Luke. 
So instead, we're ranging a Luke-sized target. Well, how tall is Luke? Is he like 5'8"? Tantrum, what is your actual height? Over. Five feet eight-ish inches. Yeah, right. Five nine. <laughs> that was even less. Boring. Be advised, that's what uh, I guessed. However, Nova Two is calling BS on your uh, your estimate. Over. Also, while I was trying to range him, he was actually standing with a very wide stance to keep his balance on a slope, so he was even shorter than his actual height, which was shorter than the average height. Luke is a short king, there are many in the world, they are valuable and valid just the same as anyone. We were also ranging during the late afternoon, so the laser of the rangefinder was not visible to the naked eye and nobody was using night vision. But scope glint is visible to the naked eye and so is the flash of the clear plastic ranger card. Also trying to measure the height of a target against a mill or MOA grid reticle requires you to hold the scope very still because you have to count the height of the target in relation to the number of hashes on your reticle. Trying to do that standing or kneeling is actually surprisingly difficult. You may need a supported position to get an accurate read on the number of mills or MOA that a person is tall. All of that being said, however, all of the methods that we tried were close enough to accurate to provide reasonably effective area of fire. But only the laser rangefinder was accurate enough to really make first round precision hits viable. In order to make long range, first round precise hits a reality, you're probably going to need more data than just the accurate ballistic distance to target. That means wind, pressure, etc. Stuff that you gotta get with, for example, a Kestrel or other standalone device for measuring atmospheric conditions. Just fucking send one to see if you're even anywhere close to target. This is gonna take me a second because of how fucking wobbly this goddamn thing is. Yep, all right, going hot. I'd say you're on. Cool. All right, let's go home. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. So, keep all that stuff in mind. You should definitely have some method of estimating distance to target in your kit somewhere, particularly if you're using a magnified optic or anything that's theoretically capable of taking long-range shots. But if you're shooting at extended ranges, especially beyond the mean point blank range of your optics zero, you're going to need quite a lot more data and it's gonna have to be a little bit more precise than that. All right, thank you guys very much for watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to support me, please subscribe and consider checking out my subscribe star link in the video description. I will talk to you guys again very soon. <laughs> the most insane nonsense ever. Look how high I can get it to go, ready? It's like, yeah, it's like clicking a, <laughs> clicking a Bic pen when you're already finished taking the test. You're like, <laughs> Good lord. Alright, you're cut off.